so uh good evening ladies and gentlemen friends from the media and everybody else the students and whole lot of uh, architectural fraternity which is here thank you so much for coming and although it seemed to be a rainy day it seems the weather pretty okay now uh so without uh, delaying this further as is very customary and auspicious we will like to start with lighting of the lamp before we take the formal program ahead so i'll request uh, chairman sir please come on the stage i'll request uh, mr anjan lendron professor ravindran mr dulal mukherji and uh, mr patu anjan das to please come up on the stage and do the honors uh gentlemen just be on the stage i'll just request uh, i'll request uh, so parthoda please be on the stage i'll just request parthoda to please felicitate professor ravindran this is a traditional welcome that we offer to all our guests Mr. Dulal Mukherjee to kindly felicitate Mr. Angel Andrew. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Angel Andrew. He has come all the way from Sri Lanka. We hope this is going to be a wonderful evening that we'll have both of them together. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Please, if you can take your seats. thank you so much kindly uh, if the lamp can be removed ashish sir i'll request mr ashish charji to please come and uh, welcome the guests distinguished guests fellow architects students enthusiasts and friends from the media and our guest speakers anjalendran and professor kt ravindran 
It is both my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to the fifth edition of the annual Charles Korea Memorial Lecture in Kolkata. But for the COVID disruption, this could have been the seventh edition. We are here to remember and pay tribute to one of the greatest architects of independent India, who was a legend in his lifetime and continues to be the guiding light even after his demise. His legacy lives on. We are here to celebrate, also celebrate contemporary architecture that has at its core human-centric Korean values. Korea aimed to elevate architecture from the mundane to the sacred by scripting special narratives that made the user or the visitor an integral part of the man environment amalgams that he successfully created. Charles Korea was amongst the few architects who attempted to unshackle elitism in architecture and included the common man to experience art and architecture in the public domain. What Korea started as a protagonist inspired his peers and contemporaries and unleashed a new syntax in spatial planning. Korea and Geoffrey Bauer shared similar principles. I mentioned Bauer because we have our guest lecturer, Mr. C. Anjal, Anjalendran, all the way from Colombo, Sri Lanka. Several decades in formal academics, accorded Professor K.T. Ravindran from Delhi, an architect, urban designer, opportunities and introspection for assimilating and understanding. His concern and grasp of multiple domains is testimony to the way to his evolution as an intellectual of very high order. He thinks that our response to culture shapes cities, the way we treat and link spaces, our definitions of privacy, etc., are cultural backgrounds that have an effect on the way we design and create our spaces. He disagrees that Indian cities are chaotic and believes that a city space is essentially the existence of multiple equilibriums active in a dynamic environment at the same time. Architect Anjalendran, the master architect and artist that he is, has managed to marry architecture with art. He is one of the first proponents in Sri Lanka who bridged the gap between the producers of art and its consumers. That was path breaking. His architecture woven between trees and fields is restful and meditative. Through effective organization of space, you can create tranquility, he proposes. His minimalism is a core strength that permeates through his lifestyle. Culture is a huge part in him and it defines his work. Anjalendran is a combination of modern minimalist tradition and the strong cultural component of Asia. He's an enlightened modernist thinker in terms of space and spatial interpretation. He often proclaims, I cannot, I don't want to change the world. I want to make a few people around me happy. With that, I want to set the tone of today's evening and I want to thank our patron and constant uh, support that we have obtained from him, Mr. Harshbar, the Neotia, Chairman Amuja Neotia Group, and also the team that has supported this event, led by Vijay Shankar Drivedi, Vice President, Corporate Communication Amuja Neotia, Shubra Sharkar, and the rest of it. So I think one big round of applause for them. And I would like to now invite Chairman Amuja Neotia. Sri Harshwardhan Niyotia to come on stage and share his thoughts for the evening. Thank you, Ashish. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, profuse apologies for being held up. It is a truly a great honor and privilege to have amidst us two of the great architect professionals 
and we are we have just been introduced to them by Ashish so I'm not going to add any more other than to say a very warm welcome sir very warm welcome to both of you thank you very much for taking time out and being here in Kolkata and we are truly honored and delighted to have you with us architecture uh, is not a subject that I have learned but somehow I had the privilege of growing up in a family that was involved or rather patrons of supporters of art in various forms mostly art as in visual art music literature philosophy I don't know how serendipitously I accidentally got involved with real estate construction that was absolutely accidental many people think that I chose this as a as a business but that was not so I just happened to be around when my father introduced me to a friend of his who had a piece of land and I was asked if I could help in building that I was 22 years old I knew nothing about architecture so I started the project just like an entrepreneur but in the course of building it I came across some amazing architects I have to acknowledge that my learning here began with Mr. Ashok Nayak architect Ashok Nayak he was the first architect that I met in that real sense uh, in an intimate sense I would say and he took me under his wings and shared over hundreds of hours various thoughts then many colleagues Parthuda Ashish included we worked together in an organization that we set up to design some of the projects that we were working on my friend Raja Kundu who's now in the US so they became influences then early on I got introduced to Dulalda to Probirda most importantly and Probirda became a very very close mentor uh, I have got less firing from my father and more firing from Probirda for those of you who know him know that he had this loving uh, temperament and at the same time a temper and whenever I kind of did something stupid or he thought it was stupid uh, there was a volley of uh, firing that I got but anyway that was wonderful because what I learned at his uh, under his tutelage and then a big change happened when I got the opportunity to work with Balkishan Bhai Doshi and Balkishan Doshi ji not only was an architect to me but he actually became like a father to me he lived in our home whenever he visited Kolkata and he would wake up very early in the morning and he would summon me and there would be hundreds of hours of talk very very varied not just about the work that we were doing but more about life and that relationship which started in the mid 90s which is now about 27 years ago 20 almost 30 years actually 93 94 uh, continues till this day every three months four months to take my dose of learning I make my trip to Ahmedabad and spend a very three four hour long afternoon with him listening to him absorbing him and it's been a life transforming uh, act and then of course I got the opportunity to work with the very famous Mr. Charles Korea and I have shared this before it was a khatta mitha kind of a ride uh, lots of uh, fights fights means that I couldn't fight with him one way fights but again he brought a masterpiece to Kolkata which I remain ever grateful for and to see a master so closely at work was a fascinating experience so this journey has really brought me close to architecture I have not been taught architecture but somehow with the influences that came around me I, I feel very close and if 
I feel if I had a, another vocation at all in my life, I would love to be an architect. Thank you very much, all of you. Many of you have been part of our journey. Many of you have worked with us in our projects. I hope that we can continue to bring interesting projects, interesting architects to the city of Kolkata and hope that we can add a little bit to the life and to the skyline of this place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Niyotia. We now start the main program comprising of two lectures, 45 minutes duration each, and if time permits, we'll have a short question and answer sessions. The first lecture will be delivered by Professor Katie Ravindran. I would invite Dr. Alokananda Banerjee Mukherjee to come on stage and take the honors of introducing Professor Katie Ravindran. Um, and thereafter, please, Katie, you could come and start your lecture. Okay, good evening. So uh, I've been asked to introduce a person who needs no introduction. I just have to read one page. Uh, the person who's also responsible for my being able to stand here and say two words confidently, a person who has been synonymous to Urban Design School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi for, the, uh, for more than three decades. Uh, the person has also been a long-standing collaborator of Charles Correa in various capacities and fora, both national and international. He is a member, governing council, chairman of the Architectural Heritage Advisory Committee, convener, Delhi chapter, INTAC. He is a trustee, the Madhavan Nair Foundation, Kochi. He was a member of the advisory board of the United Nations Capital Master Plan, New York. He was the consultant uh, to the President of India, a consultant to UNESCO. He was Dean and Senior Academic Advisor, Rick's School of Built Environment for seven long years. He was founding president of the IUDI, which is Institute of Urban Designers India, the former uh, chairman, Delhi Urban Art Commission, and has been a member of many such committees dealing with urban conservation, smart city, public uh, open spaces, Overall, the up kind of the, uh, the sustainability and inclusivity of urban realm. His most recent work was the preparation of resilient urban design framework for low-income state housing in Tamil Nadu for the World Bank. With an experience of over 54 years, uh, his current practice includes design of green city, uh, greenfield cities, cultural buildings, memorials adaptive reuse, urban conservation. He has also been a member of Unnayan, an NGO uh, working with the low-income communities in East Kolkata for about two years. He has constantly pursued sustainability, indigenous urban design, and urban conservation, championing the causes in multiple international fora and academia, and keeps inspiring us to do more for our uh, socio-economic continuum. He is none other than Professor K.T. Ravindran. I'm still shaking from inside. <laughs> Hope I <laughs> could read it properly. I request him to kindly come to stage and share his insights on architect Charles Korea. Please, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Alokananda. Was that rather long and kind of flowery introduction? Thank you so much. <coughs> uh, I'll have to be very fast because I have just 45 minutes. And as a professor, I'm used to a captive audience and I don't know when to stop normally. So I'll try hard to keep time. You know? 
Ashish, you will excuse me if I overrun. Okay. A warning. I'll try and keep time. So uh, basically, what you see on the on the screen is how we describe our practice. You know? so it comes from an original quote from Chinmayananda, which said, "Poise in action is yoga." Okay, I think I think it is a very substantive quote that uh, he gave, and I've taken off from that concept and come to place context in the place of yoga. So it's for you to think through the rest of it. Uh, my association with uh, Charles Korea goes back to, active association goes back to 1985. Even though I read an article he wrote in the 60s when I was a student of architecture, and at that time I was a big fan of uh, Louis Mumford, so I was not very impressed by his article. But later, I, in 1985, when I started teaching in SBA, uh, there was this competition for the IGNCA, first international competition. And I happened to work out the design framework and bring out the brochure for that competition. I think it was India's first proper international competition. And Charles Korea was an advisor and a juror for that project. So that's when I actually began to interact with him. And subsequently, through the years, I have met him in so many different forums. But finally, the most active part is when he was the chair of the Delhi Urban Art Commission. He was the first uh, architect chairman. Before that, it was always the retired secretary who became the uh, commission chairman. Uh, but Korea, they made an exemption, in the case of Korea, and they made him the chairman for the first architect. And uh, he had organized an exhibition in Delhi and I happened to curate that exhibition. That time I was a member, before he came as chairman, I was a member of the DUAC, and I curated that exhibition. And subsequently, after he, his time got over in the DUAC, I had the privilege of sitting on that big chair as his successor, and I continued to interact with him. I also had the opportunity to be in a jury with him in Germany, so we traveled together and spent time in Germany doing the jury work. He and I were the Indian jurors, apart from a group of Germans. Anyway, to cut the story short, uh, I am a very big admirer and fan of Korea for his brilliant mind and his immense design capability. I think he's perhaps the most gifted architect that we have in this, uh, in this country. Where do I point this? Oh, all right, thanks. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Has it skipped one slide or what? Sorry, I will not read this because I've just told you quite a few things about him. And, uh, uh, I will first present a kind of an overview of Korea's work as I read it, okay? Everybody has different ways of reading the same story. So the way I read this story, in a very brief presentation, I'll, I'll show it you. And then subsequently, I'll show three projects that my own studio has done. Now, by no means am I trying to compare an elephant with a goat. Okay, I'm simply showing how, as I said, everything can be seen differently, how we saw it differently. Yeah. And part of that work is outside in the panels, but I'm not showing any of those things which are already in the panels, I'm not going to show you. I'll show you three other projects very quickly over. So this is Korea. Uh, and the man behind him is a Calcutan. Okay, but it was taken in Germany. <laughs> so uh, my own surmise is that Korea actually organizes his work around these four basic principles. First thing is, there is a pergola which is pervasive in his work. Second thing is that he 
makes a very clear attempt to negotiate the sky. Third is that he earths his buildings. And the fourth is that the picture wall is a very important component in Korea's work. I mean, you're all familiar with it. These are very simple interpretations. Uh, and uh, he deploys these four instruments in varying forms in all his, pro almost all his projects. Changing direction for this is, this is just a slight change. Okay, this is a kind of state changer. Oh, all those pictures are taken by me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next. Ah. All right. So basically some examples of how the pergola has been used in various locations. Uh, you can see also the city center is also there in which he uses pergola, pergola very minimally. But uh, in most other projects, he uses them very strongly. And it is there in every project that he does has the pergola in it. Next, please. You've gone back. So the confusion is just not mine. <laughs> I think it belongs to the machine. <laughs> yeah, OK. So uh, I think you skipped one slide. All right. OK, go ahead. So uh, basically, the second thing is that he negotiates the sky very carefully. You know? he, makes sure, he makes sure that the skyline of the building enters the sky, and the sky enters the building. So it's never a flat finished rooftop. It's always a variation which I've called it, he choreographs the skyline to be able to dance with the sky. So that's, I think, is a very important aspect of his work. And these are all examples. I won't go into details because I'm short of time for it. Basically, he, you can see that he has a very animated skyline in almost every case. And that actually interfaces with the sky. And that's an important relationship in his buildings. Next one, please. More examples of it. This is uh, basically the two examples which are uh, quite rare in his work. First one is uh, towards my side. You will see the Vidhan Sabha, which actually is a takeoff on the Sanchi Stupa, which is just next to Bhopal. And you can see the way the Sanchi Stupa in reality is located on top of a hill and how he uses the profile of the dome exactly in that manner in the Vidhan Sabha project. So this is one of the rare examples of how Korea has made a departure from its modernist move to a more contextual kind of move. And it's interesting to note that it also happens in the 80s, early 80s, when uh, postmodernism had just come into the fore. Anyway, it took them many, many years, 15 years or so to do it, so meanwhile, he also commenced work on the Jawahar Kala Kendra. And you can see how surprisingly similar the two sections are. One is Jawahar Kala Kendra and the other is the uh, Vidhan Sabha. So they are almost as if he took this section and used it there. But the, the, his, the, his skill lies in the fact that the experience of going into these buildings are very, very different. They are extremely different because of the way he articulates the walls and the way he articulates the ground. Next one, please. I am moving over to another subject. Next one, please. Yeah, the next important aspect of his work is that he earths every building. They have a solid contact with the ground and <coughs> he handles the land profile in a very interesting manner always using the land profile to become the profile of the floor of the building. In other words, they flow together, the floor and the, the landform. And uh, the, the plan that you have is, uh, is that of Kasurba Gandhi Samadhi in Pune. I don't know how many of you have seen it. If you haven't seen it, you've lost an opportunity because it was done back in 1962 
when he's just come back to practice in India. And it is the forerunner of the Vidhan Sabha. So interestingly, 20 years later, he uses same thematic content of dealing with the floor as in the Kasurva Memorial. Kasurva Memorial is near Pune, behind uh, the Aga Khan uh, Palace. And now, unfortunately, they have defaced it totally, so you'll never be able to experience it again. And you can see the section of the Vidhan Sabha, and that's very similar kind of modulation of spaces. You enter from an open court, enclosed court, under a, through the building, under it, and then you emerge in a court where you have important components. I mean, you turn around, what do you see? You see the same thing. You see the truncated pyramid on top of both these buildings. But unfortunately, in Kasurba Memorial, now they have removed the truncated uh, pyramids and they have concrete, made a flat concrete roof there. In fact, the Charles Correa Foundation is not even aware of the changes which have been made. I phoned and told them last week that these very significant changes have been made to the building. Uh, so the images that you see here is of, first one is of Javar Kalakendra, which uses the same idea of the kund in the center. Next you see the Ayuka in Pune, which also has exactly same kind of a uh, kund in the, in the middle. And you also find the, in the, your own very city center, uh, you find that he has a simulation of a kund which has now become a very interesting public space. I think this is one of the most successful public places where almost everybody is comfortable. Right? Uh, no matter whether you, which class you belong to, you're comfortable in that center. I think that's uh, one of the greatest successes of a public place which Korea himself has designed. Next one, please. It's an image of him at the jury. He's a great storyteller excellent conversationalist, and everybody was listening to him with, with rapt attention, even in that jury. Uh, he's very well-read, well-informed, he's very humorous, and he speaks with great diction. It, he's a master communicator, not just in his design, but also verbally. Next one, please. This is the last of the technique that he employs in almost every building, that is the technique of the picture wall. Uh, most of these pictures are by me, except for the one in, uh, in the museum, Crafts Museum in, in Delhi, they have altered that museum completely also in its feel. Uh, what you see are Javar Kalakindra and what you see here on the side is the Indian Embassy in New York. There also, it's a very narrow plot, a tall building, but he uses the first few floors to generate this potential for a recessed picture window to be created there. Very similar to what he has done in British Council building, for instance. Next one, please. Now, the picture wall continues. He uses the idea of the picture wall in very many different ways. Uh, first two images you see are from Goa. I mean, the entire top line is from Goa. And uh, the ones below on the two extremes are that of uh, the British Council. And in the center, you have the, uh, the Brain and Cognitive Sciences Center in MIT. The interesting thing about the MIT project is he uses the wall itself as the picture. He modulates the wall in such a way that it, that itself becomes an image. Uh, and no applied art is applied in that case, but it's a different way of mediating the wall and, they, and, and thereby changing the, your experience of the building. This, these are like some of the very interesting things he did. What you have on this extreme corner is actually the same theme which is inverted. In the case of British Council, it's like looking down. In the, in the case of the Vidhan Sabha, it's looking up and it's very similar recessed large-scale recessed surface in which he animates it by a picture wall idea. Uh, I won't go into more discussions. We'll stop. Next one, please. So uh, basically, one other important thing that he does in the plan, in invariably, is that he circumscribes his building with an outside layer, like an outer skin, which in fact divides the inside and the outside quite drastically. 
he creates an altogether new context inside and the outside context is kept out. In other words, he decontextualizes the building. He turns it into an object, like in classical modernism, you can then take that object to any place you want. And only the internal experience remains. So this is uh, uh, basically a, a way of looking at his work. You all have your own way of looking at it. We are all architects, professionals. We all think differently. We should think differently. And I'm sure you'll have your own view. This is, uh, this ends the Charles Correa bit. And then I move on to the projects done in our own office. I'd like to repeat that I am by no means comparing our work with his work. There's no comparison at all. I'm very well aware of it. Uh, we are all great fans of his work. But our departure points are different and therefore our arrival points are also different. Yeah. So it is just to show more that difference in approach how two or three or four, how may, however many projects as you have, that many ways of looking at it can be generated. Because that's essentially the way we look at it. So we don't look at it like the classical modernist way in which uh, the purity of the idea can be taken across the globe. You can put it anywhere you like and it, it create your own context. And the building also becomes it's the new context of the environment. So uh, whereas our approach is absolutely uh, upside down from that, we extract everything out of the context. Yeah. Next one, please. So uh, one thing that I'd like to emphasize before uh, I go ahead to show you the projects is that uh, this is not just my work, okay? It's the work of a group of very bright people. I was lucky to get some of the finest people in my studio, not as designers, but as human beings also. Few of them are sitting in this hall. And uh, I want to emphasize the fact that Architecture as a product is a collective endeavor. It's a collective product of a group of people and not that of one individual, okay? We might, when the person is larger than life, like Korea, we might attribute everything that happens in the studio to him. And he was also quite careful that he controlled everything and he had a brilliant insight into what each one is capable of and he extracted the best out of them and so on. But our work is, uh, is that of co-production. And it's a variety of people. Next one, please. I have the mugshots of about 70 odd people who worked with me in the last 30 years, 30 odd years. This is a, an incomplete set of mugshots. But the interesting thing is that uh, there's a variety in the kind of people. So I've tried to express that by lo looking at people's faces and the colors and the form and their posturing to the outer world and so on, and in all its variety, because it's that that lends variety to the work. And that variety, in my, my view, is the most important life-saving uh, approach when it comes to subsistence of life you know, and the sustenance of time and life. That variety is very critical to our work, not the sameness, like I demonstrated to you how Korea uses you know, a set of language in varying doses, and he of course elevates it to a very poetic level. Uh, we may not, be, may not have been able to do that all the time, but what we attempt is that to express the, the genius of every person and bring that variety out into the character of the building. So that's what I'd quickly demonstrate to you in the next three projects. Next one, please. Could you please change? Yep, uh, this is uh, three projects which I'd like to show you. All of them happen to be from the south of India. That's just an accident, okay? Because I chose four buildings and I cut down one later when I was told that I have only 45 minutes and not one hour. So I have tried to reduce the number of projects. That was a cultural center in Madhya Pradesh. But instead, I'm showing you three of these projects, each of them carrying a different kind of value. 
So what I'd like to underline is that through the action of this group of people who work together for the last 30, 40 years, I mean, all these people are not together in the same time in the studio. They are like the Navaratnas of Vikramaditya's uh, court. They lived in different times, but we now count them together as nine numbers. Yeah? So it's like that. They all uh, worked and lived in different times, and they expressed things differently. And, uh, but the underlying value of the work, values that we hold in our work, actually comes out in the way they act. It's through action, not by what you're saying that you develop your value. So it's that action of those people over a period of time with differing approaches to the context that gave the value base of the collective work that we have produced. Yeah. So I have chosen the projects in such a way that each of them exemplify one value or the other. First one is the Jawaharlal Nehru Junior College in Lakshadweep Islands. It was done way back in the 80s, 88 actually. Uh, which was driven by the quality of environment that there was in Lakshadweep. I'll come to the project in a short while. And then you have the Rajiv Gandhi in Nivagam in which the politics of his memory is celebrated. Yeah. I had great difficulty in dealing with that project because I wasn't a big Rajiv Gandhi fan at that time in the 80s when he was assassinated, in the 90s when he was assassinated. But then I had to overcome that within myself. You know? So I read poetry and I read philosophy. I read nothing on architecture. It was a competition. It was a limited competition. And when we began to work on the competition, I started reading extensively in the morning, basically poetry and philosophy. Yeah. And out of that emerged the detoxin that made me prepared mentally to work on that project. And then I also had a great uh, person working with me at that time. I call him my guru actually now. Uh, he is Siddharth Mitra is his name. He's not here, he lives in Delhi. And uh, he told me that if you cannot leave this baggage behind, we won't be able to do any positive work on this project. So that was a great advice which I received from one of the people in who was working in my office. He was a student in SBA when I was teaching there. And then with that, we moved forward on that project. So the, how do you interpret the memory of a person in a, from, with a detoxified mind is the demonstration of that project. And the final result is one of a very peaceful environment. If you happen to go there, you will experience it. Third one is a project which is not yet executed. It's a current project on the, on the in the studio. It's a memorial for Justice Krishnayar, who was a revolutionary uh, judge in the Supreme Court. And he was also the law minister of Kerala in the first Marxist government. So there's a memorial for him being created in, in uh, Kochi. So that, these are the three uh, different approaches that I wanted to show you. There is a, the fourth project that is not shown, I'll do it another time when there's an opportunity, is a cultural center in a place called Riva in Madhya Pradesh, which is a largely tribal and Dalit district. And uh, the approach to that whole project was very different from the way we approached the other schemes. Extreme, very context, in fact, once you start exploring the context, you cannot end up with the same solution. You cannot end up with the same language. Needs a different language, different approach to express it. Next one, please. So first I'll quickly show you the Jawaharlal Nehru Junior College in Lakshadweep. Uh, next one, please. That's the, an image of, of, the, of one of the islands. That's the capital island, Kavriti, as seen from a helicopter. I had the opportunity to go once with a the helicopter there. And uh, <clears throat> some fact sheets on what uh, Lakshadweep is, is about. And you, I also have in red emphasized the fact that the extremely fragile physical environment of Lakshadweep Islands have generated the quality of a quality of a very delicate vernacular form. Yeah? So that's what has driven us also in that project. So it's driven by 
the fragility of the environment, the approach to work. And when I say environment, it's not just about the physical environment, it is also about the social environment. Yeah. Next one, please. So these are the, the 10 different ways in which drivers of the project, uh, how we reacted or responded to the fragility of the island's uh, environment. I won't read it because it'll take me too much time if I read it. Let me first explain you that sketch. What you see there is a kind of schematic section of an island which is surrounded on one side by the ocean and the other side by the lagoon. Lagoon is a shallow four or five kilometer uh, wide, uh, shallow water body, which has a very unique life of its own, unique uh, marine life of its own. Plus, it also has the, uh, the largest amount of coral reef on it. It's the coral reef which actually defines the lagoon differently. So, uh, and the, the water that they use, the population uses, is actually from what is called a sweet water lens, which is there below the surface of the ground. So in spite of being surrounded by saline water on either side, the island has a sweet water lens from which they extract the water. So in these long islands, they take water from one end, then they run the pump from another end every day. It's an, it's an orchestrated extraction of water. Like this, they have to vary the extraction. If they do it from one point, salt water will ingress into the, into the sweet water, and then the island will have to be abandoned. It cannot be occupied up there because you will not have drinking water. So it's a very delicate balance with which they manage water. So the use of water in construction was a key issue that we had to face. Yeah, and this is also for the first time they were creating a residential school and they're not used to such large projects coming up in the island. They all have small, small huts and people are scattered, they're fishermen and so on. Next one, please. So this is just about some fact sheet about the Lakshadweep Island, not numbers, but other facts, qualitative facts, which actually also drove our design decisions. Yeah. Most important thing to remember is that these are very old islands. Yeah. People are living and dying in that same island for years and years. Islands are not more than sometimes only half a kilometer wide and 10 kilometers long. So if you walk half a kilometer, you reach the lagoon from the, from the seaside. So it's just that small, the place, and it has a very small population scattered across the islands. And the northern side always has more water than the southern side. Uh, I won't read the stuff because you can read it yourself. Next one, please. So these are a few images of the people because, uh, as I said, the social environment is as important as the physical environment. Environment is not just about climate and water and heat and uh, you know uh, humidity and all that. It's also about people and how people have built their own lives around certain environments. So these are images for the, uh, the, uh, the, at the bottom you have images of the people. They're mostly fishermen and they are 99% Muslim, 99.99 Muslim. And uh, like uh, places like uh, Kashmir and all, people can't migrate into that place. So they remain as a pristine kind of population. And uh, what you have on top is a darga, image of a darga. They borrow quite heavily from Kerala architecture also. And on this side, you have the image of the stone. It's a kind of very soft sandstone. You can cut it with a saw. Yeah? And it's this sandstone which is used for construction. Now the sandstone is banned. Okay? Interestingly, the extraction of all local materials are banned because the scale of construction has superseded the capacity of the, the islands to carry that load. So they've banned the, the use of, so all materials had to be brought in from the mainland in, in ships and barges. Next one, please. So uh, actually how that translated into building is a very interesting dimension. It, basically the buildings are organized very randomly in land because they don't have plots, okay? They have some rough idea as to who owns what. And their ancestors are buried in the same land. 
they are very scared of their own ancestors spirits so in the night they close all the windows and they sleep and they sleep inside they close all the windows so it's a kind of uh, an environment in which they are they have invested emotionally into the land you know? land is very scarce because the islands are very small and you can't keep using them so that drove the way we designed and we we had to do two story buildings even though the island traditionally built only one story you know? in order to save land because the school is a residential school and it requires the requirements are large compared to you know any other uh, buildings that they had originally in the island so that's the kind of scattered plan we created with courtyards without any boundary lines that is buildings are organized randomly without compound walls no roads no paths not even like you know open jointed paths in order to protect the contiguous nature of the land so it's like just like the islands they are like scattered structures in the open land next one please please change yeah this is a, there are two basic clusters in which the place is organized uh, what you see here the large court form is a teaching block which is the image that you see here it was originally a single story leprosy sanatorium and the pwd wanted to remove it and then construct reconstruct a new building there but uh, i was able to since i came from delhi big place i came with the minister flying in from the helicopter and all that dropping from the sky so i had some leeway over them and i said nothing doing i'm not going to demolish the building because the most sustainable building is the existing building whatever you do is going to actually load up the place more so it was so important to save the the existing building and so we salvaged the existing building and converted in spite of the stigma that it was a leprosy sanatorium converted that into the school and created a building a group of buildings using basically uh, materials coming from kerala of course the transportation cost is very high the fuel cost is very high embodied energy is very high but it's better than ruining the island yeah so you have to make a choice between the two decisions so we used we even brought uh, lightweight concrete precast concrete slabs from pune by ship and so that we save on sweet water for curing the concrete so all slabs are made of that so you don't spend sweet water because even by doing the building right there without thinking about the sweet water lens we could have contaminated the island and the island would have to be abandoned there's no negotiation once it becomes saline uh, next one please so these are a few images of the the classroom blocks we try to create an, an architecture which looked like it was always there that was the driving factor the of the final image was that it should not look like it came from somewhere it should look like the building was always there so that's what we try to create the shot is taken uh, nearly 30 years after it was built yeah so it's uh, they are maintaining it very well this is a recent shot uh, next one please and these are some of the uh, the an important characteristic which we try to incorporate is the idea of the transient spaces that is the idea of the veranda you know i know anjan is here who runs a place called the veranda and the veranda is actually a very evocative term it's neither the inside nor the outside it's a sheltered space you are with nature at the same time you are not with nature it's a very ambiguous liminal kind of quality city box so that was an important component of this building that we had this liminal spaces that define the closed room from the outdoor next one please that's uh, an image of the the main classroom and administration block sorry the slide is a bit loud in its color uh, because it's an old image we try to salvage it next one please that's the end of one project this is uh, how am i doing for time ashish yep all right Okay, the next one I am going to show you is the Rajiv Gandhi Ninavakam, built in Sri Perumbudur, where he was assassinated. 
now as i told you it was a very difficult decision for me to when i was invited to participate in the competition uh, five people were invited and i was one of them when i was invited it was very difficult for me to decide to do this or not to do this because i was reading indian express every day and indian express arun puri was going <laughs> you know hammer and tong on the front page every day against him and i was somewhat uh, biased and influenced by that not biased perhaps rightly so i don't know i don't want to sit in judgment of that now but however that we were able to cross that our own threshold and go into the project go and enter the contest so the first site visit that i made to the site this image is from the first site visit uh it is a pond in which right in front of me a frog had leapt into the pond yeah it is just a village pond it had like overgrown grass on all sides and so on and there were frogs and fish and so on so uh that image evoked the idea of a poem which i had read from basho basho is a 11th century uh, japanese poet he wrote haiku poems and uh i was reminded of that poem and i realized the significance of what i just saw you know the kind of the kind of waves it can create the waves it created in my mind at that time uh became the most important threshold for us as far as the project is concerned that is to bring about the transparency in a in a place in a site bring about that luminous quality that there is as well as to influence send the waves out outwards from being a place of memorial so we conceptualized this as one part as active memorial and the other as a passive memorial so this image is very significant image for me i am not just saying it like that i have not invented it post project this is how it began yeah so the first visit that we make to the site is actually is not an analytic you don't analyze the site it's a communion between you and the site so you can literally see the skyline of your building when you're standing in that raw empty land it's so important to to connect with the site on that level so that you understand the qualities of the site and what it offers to you in terms of design opportunity so this is very different from the way korea had approached the sun as to as i have already explained but it is a way it's a different way of approaching i am not that's a very clever way what he does you know? and he he just allows the building and the land to flow together but that's not how we use the site we use it very differently you know? so this image was the take off point for that next one please so this is roughly the kind of context that we worked in that little shed that you see was the place where he was assassinated the the red square that you see is the actual mud on which his blood was mixed and the concept was that we don't build on that mud that we turn that into the centerpiece of the whole project and don't build on it and use the local building tradition and the qualities that you find in the local people etc as the driving factors for design you can also see an imagine uh, you can also see an image of uh, uh, ramanuja uh, the mathematician because mathematics is you know kind of in running in the blood of the tamil people yeah that's why they are so good in with with now in the in the electronics field they're doing so well the tamils and the telugus have it running in their blood so we realized that back in the early 90s that there is a genius for this kind of expression there and that informed the way we devised the active part of the memorial and uh, here the other factor is that the tamil desire for scale they are a very collective kind of people they emote collectively you go to a dmk party meeting and you can see everybody cutting their thumbs and putting blood tilak on themselves 
it's a very strong emotional connects that they have with ideas and people and and they worship hero worship people so and that expresses itself as scale you can see the tamil cinema posters are very famous they overtake the whole city's imagery uh, because they make them in really huge scale so that sense of scale was an important factor which we would like to express in the, in the so, so that it becomes a socially acceptable imagery uh, and here's a quote very interesting quote about architecture from a very well known sthapati called ganapati sthapati who made this sculpture of tiruvalluvar that you see here it's like 41 meters tall that sculpture in stone all built in stone and it was done by him he said the universe is subject to a mathematical formula and architecture is yet another manifestation of this formula this is the formula on which all vastu is rested in the interconnected of the connectedness of the universe and that every room is a microcosm of the universe well, it's a long discourse i won't enter there but it's a very interesting factor which then informed the way we looked at the materiality of the site so we looked at the local architecture next one please we looked at the local architecture and that gave us the whole construction system and methods yeah this is uh, the siting of the project where uh, the access in access you can see the sri perambadur temple that's a 11th century temple called adikeshwar perumal you can see the spire of that from the site and interestingly for us there was also a path which people had used to create a path they were walking to the pond and creating that path exactly in that axis so that became the main uh, kind of locating principle for our so, so uh, we articulated the architecture of the space first not of the objects then we scattered the objects in the in that space in order not to violate that structure of space that exists so in other words the normal relationship that we find between space and form is actually inversed in this case is a space that generates the form yeah so there are objects which are surrounded by space so that was another important characteristic that emerged from understanding how the visuality of the site is structured next one please so this is the model which actually won us the competition it was a fantastic exercise in co-production on one side in the center you have the memorial spot where his head fell actually which was preserved uh, the soil was preserved and on 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 your uh, on your left you will see that huge triangular building which is a library building and had uh, the entire roof was sloped for solar panels this was back in 91 because rajiv gandhi was very keen on preserving the environment whatever else you may attribute to him he had a very positive attitude towards environment and technology so these two factors became strong points in the way we defined the quality of the project uh, next one please so but that is a competition winning project then we found that the plan which the pwd had sent us was completely something else from what is there on the ground they probably called the lowest quotation and awarded the work and they got some kind of a a pig instead of a cow you know so when we started measuring things nothing was tallying the site was not adding up dimensions not adding up we discovered it is a 12 acre site that it's a totally different shape and that shape doesn't fit the project that we won so only thing you can do is to modify the project you know you cannot modify the site because it's a given site so this is the final plan that emerged but that axial view of the swan remained in the in the project and uh, an entire museum that had created to celebrate technology and the 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 camera because rajiv gandhi was a very keen photographer the camera and film technology that whole thing went for a toss because it just wouldn't fit the site anymore like the way we imagined it you know so that was based on the form of the traditional uh, you know kind of 
uh, sarai or what in tamil is called satram you know where people come and stay for they it's a reposeful space around a pond so that was the theme we worked on but that had to go for a toss and that was replaced by this curved wall which carried the the whole progression of india as seen by the congress party of course from you know kind of rural culture to a kind of industrialized culture neruvian view of what the india's progress is that was represented on that wall in uh, using thematically the arjuna's penance wall in uh, mahabalipuram and recreating it with contemporary artisanal work i'll show you the results of that and that little thing that you see that small building called the facility center is the only covered building everything else is open to sky the, the monument is not covered yeah it's open to sky because the original image of the frog that led to a luminous emptiness but at the same time with ripples defined by ripples that informed the project to be without a roof so the memorial is without a roof yeah this was the only building it's a facility center with a little office and toilets and so on you know things that you need in a public place and we used a construction system where we used only stone and lime there is no concrete there's no cement in the entire project it's only stone and lime i'll show you more details of it next one please so here is the artisans at work at one time there were 300 odd artisans working on the site simultaneously at the same time and this humble man in this white dhoti is the stapati who was their head and he was also my structural designer yeah because uh, the the standard engineers uh, my apologies to the engineers in the hall are not trained to deal with stone lime and timber etc etc they only understand steel and concrete in most cases so uh, and these people have methods of finding the strength the inner strength of a stone by knocking on it with a wooden hammer so the sound the resonance that comes out of that knock tells them whether the stone is fit for this kind of construction or that kind of construction so selection of stone is a kind of intuitive process for them it's not just intuitive it's also experience based knowledge and intuition at the same time so he selected the type of stones and every time they handled the stone there was a puja also yeah, because it's also the whole conceptualization is a kind of universal uh, you know stone as a material in the universe and it's a free particle and you know how uh, whenever you deal with it you say sorry to the environment from where you extracted it and so on it's quite an interesting thing even though we always look down upon it as superstition and you know we tend to dismiss it but coming to work with this man for a good 5 years or so on that site taught me so many things about how to approach materials how to approach artisans how to approach the creation of what we call architecture through an artisanal process so these are images of how the the work carried on on the site is only few images there are many many more uh, next one please so this is finally the monument that came up without a roof uh, in my original design these black things on top didn't exist okay but it was not acceptable to the tamil nadu mps they said what is this, this is very unspiritual we don't make things which don't have a capital and a base this is not spiritual it's a uh, anti uh, my, uh, you, you can say is anti sacred in its uh, content so on so finally it was decided that we'll put this thing sculpture work on top man called uh, ram sutar he is a very well known sculpture and uh, sculptor in delhi he created these things in in bronze and they were mounted on top of these columns and the columns are 1.2 meters wide i mean in dia and they are 15 meters high yeah. they are not small they are big in scale that the tamil idea of the scale was played on in this case you can see the size of the human beings in comparison to these columns but it doesn't have a roof yeah. it's like between the sky and water 
there is material uh, next one please so these are some details of how these columns are carved originally my columns were barren columns they had no embellishment on it they were contemporary forms in traditional technique of construction but they were very keen that it should represent something or the other so it was given these pattern these are traditional patterns from the 5th century gupta period sculptures you know, representing water yamuna ganga all the seven rivers of india is represented differently as patterns because of their character and that is what is reflected here yeah it was done by an artist called a ramachandran who actually gave us sketches and some really skilled people in my office spread this on the floor and made it in full scale when you when you cover the entire pa the the circular circumference of the column with a pattern the pattern must sit wholly so it was created by them i can see that ashish is inching closer and closer so i'll be fast all right so <laughs> sorry ashish <laughs> so uh, these are some of the landscape work that was done originally was done by dr prelin singh but subsequently was taken over by shahir yeah. and uh, some of the ponds were closed unfortunately in this condition uh, because the congress party saw it as a space where they could have large gatherings and uh, some of the vidhayaks might have fallen into the pond if they had the ponds around so they wanted it closed so finally it was it was a great 10 years of struggling with your your own ideas and 10 other people's opinions the public project you know so do you stand on your own ego or you stand to represent what the collective group is actually wanting to see executed so and is that a communicable thing to the local people or it's not communicable that's a very important part of any public art what does it say to the people you know it's important that it speaks to people and they found these columns that i had designed which are just plain columns totally boring and without any no nothing to say they're not saying anything to them so finally all these things were done and this is the pathway through with that that line that you see the second white line you see is the axis in which the shikara is visible and that became the axis to approach the project the actual site next one please i'll move very quickly and this is the original path which he he walked and he was assassinated in the spot where you see this stone yeah his head was found in that location that was marked and kept and that's the path which uh, he walked so that's demarcated but notionally not as a path which people take because of course again the tamil nadu mps wanted the entry from the east they didn't want the other entry yeah so it had to be taken around and brought in in access from the east so so these are that's the detail of how that center was treated without touching the soil in my original scheme this the soil was exposed to the sky but then we have a group of artists there was another there was a man called sanjay bhattacharya who also worked with us on this so there were three prominent artists who worked on the scheme one is a ramachandran who did all the models and the bas relief detail and the other was ram sutar who built the metal work and the third was sanjay bhattacharya who did all these you know all these things that you find these petals that are scattered are actually stone so these are agra artisans who were brought in to do the stone work yeah. was not part of my original scheme but i lived with it yeah. so and uh, this this one is in the reverse from you walk towards a bar relief i'll show you details of it next one please so that's the bar relief that was created it's 6 meters high and about 40 meters wide yeah and it retains a, a raised land on the other side originally this is the place where my museum had stood so th it became like an outdoor museum of the progress of india represented by a contemporary drawn by a contemporary artist and and executed by traditional artists so it's an unbelievable uh, sculpture which the talent for which still exists in the tamil people they can still make those chola bronzes that you saw 
uh, you know, from the original Tanjavur bronzes, they can still create that. Same thing they can do even now. They have it in them. Yeah? So it's a very untapped resource. So I was fortunate that we could actually tap that resource, give so many of them employment, and get them to do a public project which then becomes an asset to the entire people. So that's that bar relief. Next one, please. So there's a close up of how the, it's even difficult to draw something like this, you know, and they've done it in stone. The project took 10 years, okay? It means a lot of patience and big holes in your pocket. I still have those holes. <laughs> but they, they executed an, a miraculous work in quality. This is only one section of the, so it continues for that all 40 meters. Next one, please. So that's a kind of swing of that stone that you see which carries those. So people, may, before they exit, they come through this. And then they exit into the facility center and then they go out. Next one, please. I'll be faster now because I have one more small project to show. Yeah, go on, please. This is just that facility center's images. Everything is done in stone, contemporary language, no embellishments, but traditional construction technique. No cement, no steel, nothing. No, even slabs are in stone. Yeah, and the thickness of the slab was determined by the stapati. Yeah, he came to the idea it should be 10 inches thick to be able to carry uh, 12 feet span. So, so be it. He even designed this, uh, the semicircular beams in the structure. Next one, please. There's no uh, engineer to calculate whether this stone can carry this curve and carry the load on top of it. He, he did the calculation. And it's now 25 years old. It's in good shape even now. These are relatively newer pictures. Next one, please. So this is the, when you go out of the place, this is what you experience. Next one, please. This, when you look back at the scheme, this is what you see. Yeah, there's a little, one of those old uh, ponds which are not so unfortunate to have been closed by a landscape architect, remained. And it's now a very beautiful space. Light hits it in a very beautiful way. Uh, next one, please. So that's the last of that scheme. Do I have time to show one small project more? Five minutes, okay, all right. I'll be very fast. This is a memorial for Justice Krishnayar. It's still on the drawing board. This is the newest project. I wanted to put this in even though it's not built because it's, it's a contemporary new project that we are working with. Next one, please. Well, I won't read it. Uh, I was personally very close to him. When I was studying urban design, he was my local guardian because that time he was a Supreme Court judge. And I used to spend my weekends in his house. I was very close to him almost like a third son. He has two sons. I was like the third, third son for the family. But now I have the opportunity to design a memorial for him in Kochi. Yeah. Next one, please. <coughs> so these are the three factors which actually helped us define what would be the character of the monument. First thing is that there's an acute sense of social justice. Krishnayar, as you know, was the first law minister who brought in the land legislation in Kerala, which changed Kerala's society. All the, you know, the, the reading room uh, movement, uh, land reforms, these are the foundations on which the current Kerala society, which is now everybody looks up to it as completely literate and you know, kind of progressive in their outlook, efficiently managed, and all that is rooted in things which that first government did, in my view. And he was a key part of that first government as the law minister. Yeah, then there's equanimity in the legal system, making the highest judicial institutions accessible to the powerless. That was something which was he was committed to. Yeah. There's cases when there's a case against a man urinating in a public place was arrested and he was taken to court and Justice Krishnayar asked the municipality, where is the nearest public toilet? They couldn't show one. So they said, so you must go to jail for this, not this man because you didn't provide it. That was the kind of approach which he had. It's always a pro-people approach. 
then he was also a very bold and iconoclastic interpretation of law that's what he did and informed by compassion it was his judgment in alabad high court which led to the declaration of emergency by indira gandhi it was he who actually uh, said that her election is invalid he was a judge you know so he was a man who didn't mince words and he wasn't scared of any institution so the memorial was designed as an inclusive public space uh, accessible to pedestrians children and the physically challenged you know and we use this image of him uh, to become his sculpture you know next one please so that's how the the site was that's how the site is located next to the high court yeah it's very well connected with public transport that little green patch triangular green patch you see is the site uh, next one please this is how the site was created okay actually it was a very badly designed intersection traffic intersection using a humongous area of land you can see the the lines of the uh, the traffic the green thing strip that you see was salvaged out of that the traffic intersection so the land didn't exist yeah and it's completely publicly owned land we were able to take out 870 square meters of land out of that intersection alone by redesigning the intersection and demonstrated to the municipality that it will they'll make a more efficient intersection with this land coming free to the municipality they don't pay for it because it's their land you know it's completely free public land and can now become an asset as a memorial so next one please so that's how the whole place is configured you have a legend here i won't go through it because i don't have the time next one please so this is how you find this is the kind of land that you are able to take out and in our design in the center there is that little ensemble of art which is a bronze sculpture of justice krishna air sitting at a desk the important thing is that he is sitting at the desk he is not standing because when a sculpture of a person is in standing position it automatically accrues a kind of power yeah so when you make him sit at your own level the and also that you can sit across it on a on a on a stool if you want you can sit and you know kind of be in communication with him even though he is a bronze if he is a bronze uh, then the power is taken out of that whole sculpture so the idea that he was an accessible judge was celebrated by making him sit on the ground and be in a conversational mode rather than you know standing like this with great power which was normally how we would approach a memorial sculpture so uh, that's the, that's the whole scheme go on please this is a detail of the scheme and these are all the images uh, the sorry the components that went into the design of this small 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 things which when it is together becomes a very potent public experience so the idea is that we bring in small things which are connected to his persona as well as connected to the area and then celebrate it as a set of uh, program then use that to design the contents the next one please so this is how the, it is viewed at the ground level from the road it has no compound wall so it's just anyone can walk through children can go there vagabonds can go there drunks can go there everybody should be able to access it you know because we don't realize that those vagabonds and the drunks have been wronged by society that's why they are in the condition that they are in nobody is born as a child nobody is a vagabond nobody is a drunkard society makes them drunkards i think that's the lesson which he brought in through his judgments so next one please so this is another view of it there are quite a few things and there are characteristics of the sculpture etc is described here i won't read it next one please so the more views of it so you create a public space out of a traffic intersection which is vehicle free and is pedestrian and uh, physically challenged friendly so that's the whole idea of converting that you know into a free public asset for the municipality next one please
So this is also shows another view of it from the other side. Of course, it's accessible because everything is through ramps, no steps to, to even stepped places are all accessible through ramps. Next one, please. That's an existing building, what you walk through. Uh, existing building of the Lawyers uh, Advocates Association. There's a coffee house there inside, Indian coffee house. Yeah, Our old, good old Indian coffee house, which I, I think led the 60s revolution in, in Calcutta. They have a branch of this. So in that vein, that coffee house and the adjoining land was seen as a, the third space in the city where people would come and drink coffee and generate dissent. That's a very important part of democracy is to generate dissent. Yeah? So a coffee house space will be appended to this because it's a adjacent function. And then the open ground and the open field between the two things will turn that into the third space which will generate dissentful public opinion. That's why the coffee house in Delhi was closed uh, and demolished during the emergency because it was a place of dissent. Yeah? So that's the history of this coffee houses are like that because somehow they carry that in their gene. Yeah? So that was celebrated here by the use of it. So these are all just views. The, the red rose garden is because he was very fond of the red rose. Yeah? I don't know if it has anything to do with his socialist views or not, but he was always fond of it. Whenever I try to photograph him, he'll take a, he'll pick up a red rose in his hand because he wanted to be seen with the red rose. Yeah? So uh, there is a lot of things which have gone into it from my personal experience of having known the man for almost all of my life. Yeah? And uh, there are various views as, as it moves on, it becomes night, night views. So that is what we have been able to salvage from a traffic intersection. I think it's uh, something which the, uh, the municipality also appreciated that we were able to do this as a, to, at a uh, no cost land, 875 meters, square meters of space in a very expensive, very important location in the heart of the city that's next to the high court, at the entrance of the high court, free of cost to the local municipality. So this was the scheme, it's yet to be built. It's under negotiation with governments and smart city mission and you know, all kinds of people are involved. So I'll just have to lie down and wait. Thank you, that's the three projects. Thank you Ashish for again, for giving me the extra time to speak. Thank you and my apologies for taking more time than I was allotted. Thank you and I thank Harsh Niotia for inviting me here and all of you for being here. Thank you once and for all. Thank you. Um, I would request uh, Professor Sonia Gupta to please come on stage and introduce architect Anjulendran. Uh, you've been all waiting to hear him. So let's speed things up and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Ashish. It's such a pleasure and delight to stand before you here this evening after two years of our lives have been completely wiped out. Uh, respected dignitaries, seniors and my dear friends. Um, I'm really deeply honored to introduce to you architect C. Anjulendran. Architect Anjulendran did his architectural BSc in Sri Lanka and completed his postgraduate diploma and a research master's in space syntax at University College London. Returning to Sri Lanka, he next practiced architecture of his mother's veranda a very omnipresent space this evening, but simultaneously did errands of apprenticeship for the grand master of Sri Lankan contemporary architecture, Geoffrey Baba. This was for 10 years for no fee, following the Guru Shishya system 
of learning in Asia. He learned by watching the master resolve the dilemmas encountered by modern life and architecture. Surrounded by circumstances of war, following his natural inclinations, he embarked on projects which were utilitarian, but still retained an aesthetic appeal, perhaps better described as an architecture for everyday life. This is perhaps best exemplified by his veranda office, which is folded away each evening, as well as his mode of conveyance, a Bajaj three-wheeler, which has been stylishly upgraded. For over 14 years, Angel Endren did work for SOS Kinderdorf International, providing care for orphan and destitute children. This work has received international recognition and demonstrates his ability to provide both stability and tranquility through effective organization of space. Angel Indran has exhibited and presented his work as well as his writings on the contemporary architecture of Sri Lanka internationally. His work has been published as Angel Endren, Architect of Sri Lanka by David Robson, Tuttle, Singapore in 2009. More recently, in August 2015, the Architectural Heritage of Sri Lanka measured drawings from the Angelendan Studio by David Robson was published by Lawrence King. Arthro Magazine has just published an issue on uh, featuring his recent work, Architecture of Angelendran. Architect Angelendran has also been an academic and he spends his spare time traveling throughout the world looking at architecture and gardens. And if I may have your permission, may I also say that architect Anjulindran must be surrounded by music when he works. And he is also an accomplished dancer. Architect Anjulindran, the studio, the stage is all yours to tell us the story of your life and works. No, I was going to. Ah, okay, fine. That's possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank. I would like to thank everybody who managed to get me here, and I'd like to thank you all for being here. Uh, this is just to show that the way we look at things in Sri Lanka is about everyday things, not monuments. And this is one of my favorite images. Sorry, okay, I've just done the wrong thing. Uh, okay. Can I go? Uh, can I go back? Okay, never mind. You can see that. Okay. Uh, generally, we are interested in small things. And when I went back to Sri Lanka in 1977, there was no literature on the contemporary architecture or the traditional architecture of Sri Lanka. So we had a lady called Barbara Sansoni, who just died a month ago, who has a shop called Barefoot. Uh, she began to collect old buildings. And I helped to put this first book, uh, in about 1997, after about 15 years of work, of the traditional architecture of Sri Lanka. Uh, so, uh, next, okay. This is my type of architecture. Why you get a little building perched on a rock, it's a rest pavilion, it's called an ambalama, stunningly, looking overlooking a landscape and as i said uh, there are very places few places in the world i mean everyone says buildings should relate to landscape and nature but in sri lanka we have a tradition of where buildings are an integral part of nature you know they, are, they don't re, they don't relate to one another right so this is this building is a part of that nature i'll show you some images the next that's that. 
You can see it's perched on a rock to keep out term, the damp and termites, right? You can put a sari or a sarong, then you have privacy and you can cook in the middle. It's on the way to a pilgrimage. So there are pilgrims' rest pavilions. Next. And you can see that it, you, you can't imagine this without this landscape. You, the landscape becomes perfect because of the building. So here we have a tradition, and that tradition continues right up to things like Jeffrey Bauer's garden called the Lunuganga, where I lived for 10 years. OK, next. So this is a thing of a paradise celestial water garden in a temple painting. OK, uh, next. And this is one of my favorite ancient called Kaludia Pokuna, black water pond, because it's surrendered out. There's, you enter here, there's a stupa here, there's a double platform here and a library underneath. And the, uh, to be audient for the monks, you have to be surrounded by water, so they do it in the shape of a boat. So you get this, the Singhalese had this amazing representational attitude, and though everyone thinks that it's only the Greeks and all who understood visual illusion, the Singhalese absolutely had it at the same time. Next. So this is Kaludia Pokona where you go up the path. Next. You can see. Next. So this is the ship and that is the boulders opening up like a lotus. But you can see this man-made line accentuate what is natural. Next. And you can see in this photograph, that is a man, you know, the boulders, that's a man-made, and the monk completes the picture. So you get this perfection of all things living and uh, what's man-made and natural, an integral part of what's going on. Next. So these are other pictures of it. Next. Uh, you can see that this is a library, and that's a double platform. So that's a meditating method of the Buddhists. Next. That's the actual picture of it. Next. And you get this representation that there's water flowing through it. But that's all. And you can see man-made rock integrated to the natural rock. So this is a part of our living traditions, which I begin to observe and understand to influence my work. Next. So you can see here also you know, that's just imaginary understanding of a stream flowing through. It's not, it's, that doesn't really happen. Next. So this is again another picture. Next. And you can see there's boulders coming as a retaining wall. And this is 3rd century BC, Brahmi inscriptions, you know, throughout South India. And, and you can see the monk completes the picture, and that's a little... And that's a cave temple. Next is one of my favorite call. It's called Saserua. Next. And here also you get um, Tampita Viharas, which is raised on the ground to keep a damp, but it also means that the tooth relic could, or, or the image houses there. But again, you can see that when you have a roof like this, it is a little heavy, but clay birds are put on the ridge tile to make it an illusion of floating. Next. Next. Okay. So that is me with my class visiting that thing. Next. So my work, because I had done the Barbara Sansoni Ronald Lukoff book, uh, I started collecting buildings and that was published uh, eight years ago. It has been sold out and they have just re republished it. Next. And I mean, I, I was also fascinated, but this is one of the temples in India, in Kerala. Uh, things you can hold in your palm. So I have about three measured drawings of buildings in three uh, things. There was this little temple in Kerala. And, you know, by the time I presented my work in Kerala, all the temples, the big ones, had neon lights, plastic flowers. It's a sort of thing when you begin to understand things are going into decay. So the neighbor said, no, no, you wait. Uh, the priest will come in half an hour. And sure enough, the priest comes in a little motorbike, bare-bodied, wearing his bursti, 
and he actually brings actual oil and diyas and fresh flowers. So I'm just fascinated by this type of small, beautiful buildings. So I get it recorded from Sri Lanka. Next. So we get that. But this is a digital drawing. I mean, I managed to get some students. So you enter here. You get a veranda there. Again, it's blank. It's very much like a Sri Lankan building. But it's almost perfect and intact, you know. But the sad thing is, it'll very soon disappear. And like Barbara, my thing is that if I love a building, at least what I can do is to try and record it. And there are millions of these buildings in India, but I, unfortunately, I can't find a record of it, you know. I wish I lived here, but then I would have gone mad because I would have had to record these things with no funding. Next. So that's me with my mentor, Jeffrey Baba. And it's better to say the sort of things that influenced me. That is to say that uh, he was a non-talkative person. He never really... Uh, wanted to make major statements on architecture. You know, uh, most architects, including me, have very clear views of how architecture should be. He never spoke about it. We only find a very general two-page statement he has made in his whole life on architecture and only one interview uh, in Bangladesh. But he, his architecture, unlike everything he was taught, I mean, he was taught at the A was a receding architecture. That is to say that the architecture shouldn't jump in your face. Uh, that is not the way architecture is done or taught in, in the world. So it should be, for Jeffrey Bava, architecture should be quiet. It should be a tranquil space. It's a space in which you should be able to meditate. And the things that influence him, I mean, he essentially his first degree was in English. He did English tripos, that is, he got first classes in the first year, second year, third year. But a lot of his friends took him to see house and gardens in England, France, and Italy. And he actually, before, he actually came back and started doing his own garden called Lunugaga. Then his cousin came and said, you're going to run out of money. Why don't you go and formally train yourself? Then you can enjoy your life using other people's money. And that's precisely what he did. He went back to the AA, got himself trained. But because he had started doing his own garden, and he had seen our own heritage, though he never admitted it, uh, he had a very clear views of a very quiet architecture. You know? Uh, okay, next. So I was influenced... In, he was first... Uh, known to the public because of this white book done by Mima, and I helped him. I mean, he had two friends called Jean and Christoph from England uh, who put this book together, and I was a local counterpart. So uh, he, he generally approved. I mean, Jeffrey uh, did things in a very curious manner. I mean, he never did everything by himself. He, got, he was very good at getting other people to do his bidding, right? Uh, and so... He went up and down from England to meet Jean and Christopher May, and we communicated, with, and this wonderful book came together. You know, I mean, uh, I, I think Mima also did their first book on Charles Correa, but after this, they did a revised book on Charles Correa too. Next. So this is my office, curiously enough. So every day they fold it, but now I have two more people who work on the other side. Next. Uh, that is my dining room, which is my this is my favorite contractor who has worked with me for about 32 years. That's my engineer, who eventually became Jeffrey Bauer's engineer too. And that is me. And this is the sort of, we don't have any formalities. It's a very open house. It's completely this thing. And everybody knows what's going on. You know what I mean? That's very simple. It's, there's nothing called... Yeah, except there's probably going to be some Indian music at the background. Next. So that is my vehicle. And that's my little dog called Kalu. He's nine years old now. That's my domestic, Kuma, who has also been with me for 30 years. And I built, you'll see, I think I, I'm showing it. He has built his house. I built him a house next door to mine. Next. So I also taught our, uh, architecture. 
about contemporary architecture sphere, I control half the course about uh, design, drawing, uh, and so on. And the technical things are done differently, half the course. But that was done on Saturdays, but Fridays and Tuesdays I did. And I did a thing called experiencing architecture. I took all my students. I mean, I think that even Jeffrey would say that the only way you can learn architecture is not in a square room by going to see things. So we spent most of half our classes looking at buildings, right? Next. So this is, I'm starting with my SOS Children's Village. SOS is a very well known, it's very well known in uh, India, uh, that uh, uh, generally children belong to an orphanage. In SOS, uh, children belong to a person called a mother. And a mother uh, brings 10 to 12 children in a house. So if it's a family they thing, 10, to 12, uh, 10 houses make a village. And to integrate into the uh, neighborhood, they have schools, kindergartens, mothers. So this is the one is the goal. And I'm pleased to say that SOS themselves admit that out of about 600 villages they're done in the world, that this is probably the most beautiful. Next. So here, that's a road. Uh, this is the uh, office building. That's a garage. That's for the maintenance officer. And this is the senior co-worker, which is the village director. Then you come here. That's a kindergarten. Or you can go to the village, which, is, which has rocks. So the buildings were integrated into the rocks. And uh, uh, because we had no money to build this, we did it. This link is done within a grove of Aralia trees, I mean, Frangipani trees, which is there. Next. So that is the entrance. So you can see that the vista goes to meet the pavilion. And at that pavilion, I use that, the rest pavilion in a contemporary way to this thing. Now, we use concrete rafters because we wanted to be ecologically friendly. And we use a stone that the, where the, Granite meets the earth and is thrown by the quarry. Uh, the only thing is that it's slightly moist so that you have to uh, pest control it uh, and have it under eaves. So that seemed easy enough. Uh, these buildings, uh, given another any other project with, uh, with generators and all these projects came cheaper than that. Next, furniture, all that. So this is office building. Uh, that's a computer center. That's where the village uh, director sits. That's a medical center. That's a mother's club. Next. So that, that is, but this is to do with children. Whether, what, whether you paint it white or black or color, costs the same. So I started beginning to use color with the help of Barbara Sansoni, who is an expert on authority on color. But you can see if we buy, we salvage old doors and windows because it gives character to the building, okay? And it's cheaper. It's probably half the price of a new door and window. It's just that I think the difference between a good building and a bad building is in a good building, which is a happy building, you have to spend more time doing it, you know? Next. So you can see, that, now that's an old column, uh, colored cement, these tiles inset next. That is the avenue of trees with a rest pavilion at the end next. So that's a, and so you can see that it's, it is not separated from nature or demands attention. It's a part of nature next. So that is one of the family houses. I'll show you the plan. Uh, SOS is very clear that if a house is more than 1,400 square feet, the mother can't maintain it, but if it's less than 1,400 square feet, you can't put 10 people in it. Next. So here you have a double height space, uh, four bedrooms with the toilets in between and the kitchen. I think the whole of Asia, I actually put the kitchen in the front uh, because then the mother can supervise the children playing in the common spaces. Okay, next. So, and in typical Jeffrey Bava tradition, the drawings are done after the buildings are finished. Next. Uh, so these are, each building was colored separately. 
to give it its own character next. You can see the colorful rafters which can span large. That's an outer kitchen so that dogs can't get in. Next. Each house has old doors and an old uh, box. Next. But this is based. Now we go to the barefoot, the fabric house and says we don't want 54 inch cloth. Can you please give us 36 inch but put a design input. So the sponsors of this house uh, gave flowers to do a wall hanging. So the house becomes personalized and each house is different because it's painted differently. Next. So you can see the detailing. This is traditional Sinhalese detailing also. Okay, so though it may be contemporary spaces and all, traditional detailing is incorporated uh, so that they are not alien to the people using it. Next. So this is a box window where the children could read a book, sleep, and it becomes additional space. Next. So you can see the mother working in the outer kitchen. Next. So this is the aunt's quarters uh, so that the, in case a mother is ill, an aunt takes over for the day. And you begin to understand detailing. That is to say that if I brought this thing, this is a two-story building. This is a single-story building meeting a two-story building, but it's set back so the eave hits it. Otherwise, it will jump out. So it's a very also looking at detailing from old buildings and learning from it. Next. So this is the, you can see you go there and that's a vista. Where the aunts, these are the aunts' rooms. That's a community dining. Next. So you can see that this is the aunt's room. That's what I said that if you set it back, the roof just goes and hits it there and there, there's guest quarters upstairs. Okay, these are the aunt's rooms. Next. So you can see that the plaza, central plaza has uh, rocks and the guest veranda overlooks the central plaza. Next. So this is the senior co-worker house, which has a two bedroom with a kitchen again overlooking here. Next. Uh, and again, the same idiom. Next. So here from the central plaza, again, you go down. So there's a pavilion. But all these rocks up became become a part of the building. Next. Another view. Next. So that is from the pavilion looking back at the central plaza. And you can see the rocks being incorporated it. We didn't change any, I mean, we didn't move rocks. We put the building with the rock. Next. So that is a new, with a tree growing in the same pavilion. Next. So this is a roofscape. Uh, next. Yeah. So next. They're going down and, I mean, this is the, this was built during our 30 year war. I mean, not 30 year war, the southern insurgency. I used to go to the site past dead bodies burning on tiles. So then I used to take a little pleasure painting a wall a different color. And these used to be three rupees, which is probably one Indian rupee uh, in Sri Lanka, which nobody was buying at that time. So I incorporated in the parts. Next. Uh, we have Portuguese Sinhalese decorations in the wall murals of temples. So I use these as a source of inspirations for the children's play frames. Next. Uh, so this is a play frame. Next. Uh, that is uh, the kindergartens, which also double up as youth uh, holiday camps. The to there is a toilet outside and a kitchen. And this is a bow tree under which the Buddha retained uh, enlightenment 2,500 years ago. And the children tell their prayer each night, each evening there. And if it rains, they go into the veranda and do the prayers there. Next. So this is the ambience. Uh, next, yeah, next. So, I mean, I think that that is what it's all about, you know, not about, I mean, great philosophies of architecture, but doing buildings which are for people and children and so on. Next. So this is my, uh, I, the thing in uh, Piliandala. I didn't do the Piliandala village. It was done by an Indian. 
So here I'm doing the youth village and I just want to show you how we use color. You know, most theories of color is about very restrained and most Western people who profess theories of color have never managed to demonstrate it. But here Barbara Sansoni did this color. I mean, the sort of difference is now, one of the differences between you know, Jeffrey Bauer when he was asked, uh, he used to ask Ina, Ina asked, what colors would you like me to use? Jeffrey would always say, you can use any color you like as long as it's black, white, or gray. But I was never afraid of color, right? Um, Barbara is never afraid of color, and she was delighted that I asked to do color. So come and see what, she, this building though, I mean, Jeffrey and I never did same, similar things, but he was always a guest in my building, first guest, and I was also always a first guest in his buildings. Uh, next, so this is, I found a old cast iron, uh, archway and that goes you can see your you can actually though it's a diagonal building you can see it into the first courtyard next so this is to show i had done a pavilion so that there's a foreground for the background of the school next so that is the foreground the school is on the other side it's mirror reflected and we Instead of using pinnacles, which shows a religious building, we use birds on pinnacles, which domesticates it. Next. So this is Barbara Sansoni doing color. You know, that's Barbara Sansoni, and that's actually Chandra Rasot and Anoma Pires. That's supposed to be me in a shorts. Next. So here, she takes you through the building with a sunbeam. The first courtyard is full of yellow. You can see this purple, Columns recede, go back, the reds advance. Uh, these murals are done by an art master because, I mean, SOS doesn't have money for uh, artists. Next. So you'll find that here is the first courtyard and it takes you to the second courtyard. And I remember wheeling Jeffrey into this building in 1989. Next. And that is what you see, you know that you get columns from ultramarine to lime green, courtyards of sh shades of red, orange, and yellow. And when I took Jeffrey into this building, he said, get away. And he laughed and laughed and laughed. And I think he did enjoy it. Next. So you could see that these show that this, if you go this way, it contracts. If you go this way, it expands. That shows a clear understanding of color. You know, color is not red, blue, and white. Uh, and in this, any clothes can fit in. You know, otherwise it looks odd. When you do structured color, things look odd uh, with day-to-day -day life. So this is the sort of thing that uh, it doesn't use any money, but it gives life to a building. And that is the sort of knowledge we... And, it's just based on normal things. It's not high philosophy, but it hopefully leads to good results. Next. So that's a shrine room. We managed to get that from a junkyard. Next. So you can see these are portal frames with concrete rafters. Next. Uh, and then we added old doors and windows. Next. So these are murals painted by the art master, City Seno, who had studied under a great artist. Uh, with the youth, they painted these large murals. Next. So, Ina de Silva did this for laminated dining table cloth. She, she is a batit artist who was also very, very close to Jeffrey. Next. And what I think this is what we try to, how I was trying to achieve. And if you go to any Buddhist temple complex, not Hindu, I'm a, I'm a Tamil Hindu, is that Buddhist spaces are always tranquil. They're, if you want to, the, the spatial organization creates a tranquility. And I think in circumstances of war, that is what tri one tries to achieve, a sense of tranquility. Uh, or something that is recessive, goes into the background, and allow lives to happen. Next. So I was then asked by SOS that I could, whether I could do a farm project for the youth, on two conditions that I can't charge a fee uh, and the youth must build the buildings. 
So these are very, very down to a cheap buildings. Next. So this is, uh, uh, we first built a cattle shed. Uh, then I found this magnificent tree here. Uh, so we built a senior co-worker building there. The youth built their own house here. And this is the community thing where the youth participated in camps and so on. And this is the office building, right? Next. So you can see this magnificent tree ties the whole project together. Next. So, I mean, I can draw like this. This is one of my drawings. It is a cattle shed. Uh, it was done for 10,000 rupees, which is something like uh, uh, 2,500 Indian rupees. Okay, next. And so how do you make, make it exciting? You the, give the cow a window to look at the view. You know what I mean? <laughs> so these are the sort of things we had to do to make a exciting building in 2,500 rupees. But of course, it was built by the youth. Next. So then the, the youth also did the, this was ordered, but they painted it in a sunburst. So it's, so this is a sort of exercise that one does with almost no money. Next. So the, you get these two people only did that door. Next. So you can see that is a magnificent tree which ties the whole side together. And these two columns frame it. Next. Uh, so this is from the office going up to that. Next. So this is from the veranda of the community center looking back at the landscape. Next, you can see the tree trunk and the two fra is framed by the two old columns. Next, there's a kitchen, com community center kitchen. Next, and there's a tree growing through that, which is already there. Next, so it is a youth planning the, uh, you know, the water harvest and so on, doing the landscape. Okay, next. So this is the ambience, the final ambience. Next. So that is the piggery and hen house. Next. Uh, yeah. Next. That's the pigs. And you give a weather vane to make it a little exciting. Next. So this is the youth building their own building, right? And how do you make that exciting? Next. Uh, their, the, their director was uh, a close friend of mine. They use earth, nearby earth, with chemifix and salt. Salt to see that it doesn't, it's an anti-fungi and chemifix to bond. And they use six earth tones to paint their building. Okay, next. So that shows you a detail of that. Directed by the village director who lives next door. Next. So this is to also show that you can deal with this is a factory project. But the two young men who came to ask me to do the project said, we want you to do a happy working environment. Okay. Uh, so that was fine. Their father was not very happy about this. But anyway, so it is a very unusual fabric. It was a jewelry making factory. So it had to be a inverted, meaning you could see things from outside. It had to give pleasure within it. So you enter here, there's a security thing here. There are not many cars because most of them come in bicycles. You go down to the canteen and public toilets and sleeping if you needed to sleep, but there's a lift here and you go up next. So it's an inverted spiral. So from the road you see very little, but here, these are double height spaces from which supervision can happen. And up I had to do a terrace because flat roofs don't work without a tile roof in Sri Lanka. Okay, next. So that is, a model was done, rather rarely. You can see that it is an inverted spiral, which is also a garden, which it makes a pleasant working environment. Next. So that is the entrance. Next. So that is going inside. Jeffrey came for the opening of this too. Next. So that's a canteen. Next. So that picture summarizes. Now that is 
my understanding of a factory it is factories are not like this but uh, they wanted a fire escape so the fire escape was outside but you can see that each thing is a terrace overlooking the other terrace that's what i mean by a inverted spiral so that it was completely secure from the outside but it was completely also joyous inside next uh, so this is another detail of the in inverted spiral next another view from the upper terrace next that's next you can see the because they have a height restriction they have to put the air conditioning within the beam uh, that's another detail next right next so then i was asked by somebody to it's in 20 perches i know how is 500 square meters which had a large banyan tree to build a house i had built two other projects for them so you enter this is the garage you enter here but you see two other trees so there were three trees on the side which i preserved okay i cut two branches of the banyan tree so you enter here this is the living dining space and we are 30 feet above the neighbor uh so you borrowed their landscape uh so you're 30 feet above the neighbor and there's a bedroom ground floor this is the pantry uh, service veranda this and the, there's a domestic room and a toilet there next next yeah uh, yeah no no go back one so here when you go on to the upper floor you have a large uh, family room with the tree growing through that there's a master bedroom and toilet and the guest room i put here because if you draw the curtain you can see the tree so all the, the all the main rooms are related to the tree which is in one corner of the site next so that's a, the tree growing up which to a veranda upstairs next so you can see that that is a neighbor's tree but we are above the uh, this thing and that's a garage and these are this a cassia tree living dining next so that is from the road because that's a neighbor if you go you can the building almost disappears next so you can see that is a building you know in this whole that is that's the you know banyan tree and that is the building and that's a neighbor street next so that's the entrance next that is through the entrance you could see the cassia tree next that is the pool of water and that is the tree belonging to the neighbor at the bottom next that's a bubble and that's a banyan tree growing next banyan tree growing with a bubble fountain here next the banyan tree growing like that next uh, that's a pantry looking into the dining area next there's the other cassia tree growing through the roof next next that's from the toilet of the master bedroom toilet looking into the toilet of the guest room up on the opposite side of the courtyard next that's another detail next that is from the toilet looking at the banyan tree upper toilet next then looking into the pool downstairs with fish next so you can as you grow the tree grows over the thing and i had to just cut two branches here we did a maquette i mean we did a life size um, frame of the house uh, before we decided to go ahead with it next uh, so that is the view and the owner is was a pilot his grandchildren come and play cars in here next and that's a veranda so one of the problems you get with three story buildings is that how can you enjoy other people's uh, thing without being obstructed by their water tanks next so this is the neighbor's tree which i borrowed next so that is a water tank but you don't really see it next so that is a dia it actually comes from india next so uh, i suddenly get a call from somebody saying you know so and so uh, is going to come from uh, hong kong uh, on sunday morning can you uh, 
keep yourself free. So I said, I'm very sorry. I don't work on Sundays. Uh, I go swimming with my friends. So he said, uh, so anyway, I thought he thought I was very rude, which probably I was. And uh, so this guy uh, who, who, uh, who headed the Ogilvy and Meth over the whole of Pan Pacific, actually on Saturday went to see a beauty parade of seven architects, all whom he didn't quite feel. And then uh, this gentleman said, you know, there's a very rude, obnoxious architect called Anjali Indran. Uh, I don't think you'll want to meet him. And he said, no, sounds interesting. Uh, can you organize for me to go and see him before I fly tomorrow night? So uh, my engineer, those days there was no expressways, goes to see his mother, widowed mother, because they had an estate. But those days it used to take five hours to go and five hours to come back because there's no expressway. Now you can do it in two hours both ways. So uh, I said, I can't meet you because he was coming as an entourage. I didn't want to meet him alone. So he came and he then fell in love with my house. Uh, so I interviewed him and I said, I can't do style. I can't do this. I can't do that. And this, that, that, that. So that was fine. So he said he wanted me to build a house for him. So he agreed to go. So this is the road. There's a railway station and it goes up and it had a magnificent views of sunset and a magnificent views of hills. So it had also two bends. So I had actually done a project. I mean, I actually designed that. I mean, all the others, I, I have done this project over about 16 years. Uh, there are two bends and we did a shrine here. It, it is in a cinnamon estate, okay? Cinnamon is unique to Sri Lanka. Uh, most people who think there's a little bit grown in Kerala, but most people who think cassia in the Western world, uh, what is really thought to be cinnamon is a plant called cassia, which has none of the subtleties of cinnamon. So Miles was a historian, so he quickly picked this up. And so we did a visitor center here, uh, the manager's quarters here, and... Um, uh, the agricultural, I mean, laborers' quarters here. So there was a range of buildings to decide, which are very, very exciting because in my life, I've only done one commercial building, which is a departmental store in a place called Sucker in Karachi. Next. So this is, I can draw like this. I can't draw anything better. Uh, so I actually did it so that when you come up, you see a, a sunset, you had an informal living, formal living, dining. He wanted a screen, but we agreed. Then this is the pantry thing, and there was a two bedrooms here, and the master bedroom here, and this was a view of mountains. So he had a study and a master bedroom. Now, when he said, let's have a drink, he, he's an Englishman, so he said, let's, ha let's have a drink before dinner. I, and he, uh, so I said, look, I've got a proposal. So we did this because I said I wanted to go and see the site in the night also and at dawn. So when we went to the site at night, it was lovely because you saw fireflies here. And at dawn, you saw the sunrise here. And I, this building was set out and this piece was built exactly as I had designed it. I felt really bad because going back, I told Miles, Miles, you know, I'm, I've been rather rude. I haven't asked you what your brief is. He said, no, you just build what you have shown me. I'll be very happy with it. So I think it's very good to train your clients to do what you want rather than you doing what the clients want. Next. So this is, I, we pro, I proposed an art gallery at the bottom, accessible by the two ends. Next. So as usual, this is a drawing done. You can see there's no changes, except I did a pavilion here. So your perception of the land from here, the pavilion is on your left. So when you're outer dining, the pavilion is on your right. So your perception, the pavilion changes your perception as to where you are. Next. So you can see it's on top of a hill and the pavilion anchors the building. You know, a lot of people wonder what ties the building down. And in this building, 
it is a pavilion which happened intuitively after the initial design. Next. So this is the main entrance. You can see that these are granite slabs. Granite is still worked in Sri Lanka. These are all material available in Sri Lanka. Next. So you can see that's a pavilion and you see the sea. But see when you come here, next, that is your cross view. So these are not, this is me now beginning to do an architecture which is minimal, but which respects the view. Uh, and I think that is how architecture should be, not the building. Everyone thinks that architecture is a building. Uh, and I very soon, I mean, I actually am beginning to start understanding that architecture is something that should be invisible. Next. So this is, you go there again, next. Uh, this is a sculpture done by Lakis Senanayaka, which is, wasn't a wall, but which my client accepted finally, uh, which could be a divider between the lounge and the uh, dining. Next. That is it in the night. Each of these we got, you know, these are done by a potter. Uh, the throat was done by a Swiss designer and that was done by somebody else. But the client and I collaborated with this. This is not only mine, we bought everything together. And it was great fun. So this is called the Enchanted Forest. And I'm afraid to say that Lucky died a year ago too. I mean, these are the people who surrounded Bava. There were three people, Ina de Silva, Barbara Sansoni, Lucky Senanayaka. And they were integral to all the work that Barbara did, I mean, Jeffrey did. And I seem to be the last people they seem to have interacted with. Next, uh, these are old Dutch doors. They're about three, four hundred years. That's a German designer called Klaus. Next, that is Klaus's sculptures. Next, uh, that is sunset with the pavilion. Next, that is the pavilion again. Next, so that is the sunset hitting the veranda. Next. This is a sculpture using disused car parts called the flying horse in the gallery below. Next. This is being exhibited at Museum of Modern Art Sri Lanka, done with bottle top saying friends, local friends. Next. This is with the war, an army guy going into the wall. Next. This is a bedroom. Uh, this is by a lady called Dru Druinka who studied at Shantini Ketran. Next. So these are, you must know that generally in Sri Lanka it's sensible to build with verandas on either end. Depending on the monsoon, uh, your room is uh, safeguarded. The monsoon only hits here. Next. So that's a view and the landscape. Next. So we sometimes have one peacock, sometimes seven. Next. Uh, next. So this is a visitor center. Next. Uh, that is the, it's a courtyard building. With, uh, it, we wanted the domestics to live here, but I think it was so good, the views, that they decided to make it a upgraded thing. And at that time, things like villas were coming in. So we had a demonstration kitchen, a cinema museum, and a dining room there, but there are four rooms below. This is a phoenix representing the death of, uh, he builds his pile out of cinnamon sticks and out of which a new phoenix comes. Next. So here I designed the lamp, which is based on the Vesak lantern, under which, uh, where they celebrate Vesak with the birth, death, and the enlightenment of the Buddha. But again, something was missing, but these tie the spaces together again. Next. So it was also very difficult. This is a plan to, they finally said that uh, when the main building is rented out, the miles only comes very rarely, uh, they wanted another extra pool. And this is a very difficult exercise because cinnamon is done on steeply soaping sites, which you can't use for anything else. So next. So this is what, what, I mean, Jeffrey Barr excels in a thing called place making, where buildings, as I said, become a part of nature. So this is a pool, and you can see that there's a drop of about 25 feet. Next. So that is the pool, a perspective. You come down here. Next. And that is the pool. Next. 
So these are these slightly difficult but not impossible. Next. So you can see there's an infinity, but it blends into the landscape. Earlier you could see the sea, but not anymore. Next. And very simply detailed. It's not, it doesn't demand attention. It is meant to become invisible. Next. Yes, next. So this is the cinnamon peelers. So suddenly you wanted to build a building for the cinnamon peelers because all of the casts ignore the cinnamon peelers are right down the bottom of the list. So no other cast would go to use the same toilet, cohabit or eat with them. So this got a World Architecture Award and so this is where they peel the cinnamon and this is where they live. Next. So you can see it is one of the, that cinnamon is done with, in, this is laterite, that is cut earth. Next. So this is cement blocks with glass in the middle. Next. That is the cinnamon peelers. You dry the cinnamon, they cut the cinnamon, they do quills, they dry the cinnamon, and then they package it and send it. Next. So these are old doors and windows bought very cheaply. Next. Right next. So that's laterite, just cement painted walls, not painted, plastered walls. Next. So this is known as uh, Angelindra and detailing to add some luster to the staircases. Next. Each of those styles are one rupee, Sri Lankan rupees. It's probably two and a half Indian cents. So these are, you can see, it frames the tree. And that's what it's all about. It's not this that matters, it's a frame that matters. Next. So this is the laborers' houses, which is um, 100,000, yes, 125,000 Indian rupees. Uh, it, it has uh, a two-bedroom room. The boys sleep in the outer veranda. The girls sleep in with the ch female children here. That's again kitchen I put so that they can all control the central court. There's a storeroom because I think the poorer you person you build, a storeroom becomes more important. There's an outer toilet because toilets then don't become an interior smell which may be smelly. Next. So this is it. Again, I mean, I told you the price of this. It was... 125,000 Indian rupees. Next. Uh, so here, these are the, the atmosphere, you can say, of it. Next. Next. This is the kitchen where she can control. If a mo one mother is there, she can control the children playing. Next. These are the built-in beds. That is to study or watch television, and there are cupboards. Next. Next. And the cinnamon peelers build um, in the spot, God, goddess Patheni, she's the goddess of the anklet. In South India, she's known as Kanagi. So this is the Patheni shrine, right? At one of the bends as a vista. Next. So this is Patheni. Next. Uh, that's a Patheni shrine. Next. At the other bend, I got my students to come and they designed this, which Miles gave a price for the architects, whatever he's paying. And then we develop the drawings next. Next. Yeah. We do a maquette, actual size maquette. Next. And that is the actual sculpture. Right? That's my main contractor talking with me. Next. So then, curiously, you must know that everybody says, oh, very nice, you know, you're doing these nice buildings. Uh, it's very romantic and so on and so on, but you can't do a dev, dev, departmental store. Uh, I mean, you can't do commercial buildings, so you know you get slightly irritated. So I go to a place called Sakar, which is 800 kilometers north of Karachi, and it has these wonderful bridges and wonderful tile works from Mughal times. So this gentleman got up one day and said he was going to go to the best architects in Karachi. He went and met three. 
he met, uh, he couldn't meet any of the architects. He had a fourth one in mind, but by that time he gave up. So what he did was he went to one place, he met the administrator. Uh, and the administrator said, uh, how big is your land? So he said, my land is 20 perches. You know, 20 perches in Pakistan is small land. Uh, a house, a general house in Pakistan is 30,000 square feet, right? You must know that 5% of the gross national, no, 95% of the gross national product in the Pakistan is in the hands of 5% of the population, right? 95% of the people are poor. That's what it means, you know. So uh, then they said uh, 800, 8 hours journey, 20 purchases of land, you know, we can't do it. So he got that answer from three architects. So he said, okay, let me try this guy. Uh, and I said, no, I'll be delighted. Can you send me some pictures of your land, you know, 360 degrees. So this is what he sent. Next. Absolutely next door to the site was these two Mughal monuments. One was a tower and the other was a pleasure pavilion. Now, how can anyone resist? You know, most people are asking, what is the size of the land? How much are you building? How much money can I make? I would have done, you know, I almost did it for nothing. I mean, we didn't discuss it. Uh, he has promised me a trip wherever I want to go, but we haven't done that yet. But you found this slap bang next to the site. So you had a vista. You had a ready-made vista in an urban site. Okay, next. So, so I had done a design like this, but that got deleted by the council. I created a corner by which I, I could frame the view. So that's my client. He's called Amir Gauri. There they have contractor um, engineers. Next. So that is my building. It's a departmental store. These are double screens so that uh, uh, now for two years he couldn't air, afford air conditioning. But the people use the building because the hot air comes and goes up through an atrium. And that is, I think, the relationship of the building to the old Mughal monuments. I mean, who gets an opportunity like this? Next. So this is the thing, that is where the view is. That's an atrium. This is a departmental store. Uh, there's a water harvesting below because it doesn't get too much rain. So all the hot air goes and goes, dissipates there. And these are the double screens by which the storeroom there, but there are double screens here, right? Which cools the building. Next. So that is again the relationship of the building to the monument. And no one can build here because it's a part of the archaeological conservation zone. Next. So this is the double screen. Very simple. These are industrial perforations. Next. That's the atrium. Then I thought something is wrong to tie it together. Next. Okay. These are the views. And next. So I got somebody to design a chandelier. I mean, a mobile, if you like, of copper birds, which then ties all the buildings together. You know, next. Next. So, yeah, anyway. This is a joke, but anyway. Uh, next. So, what am I proposing? I'm proposing in the tradition of Baba, I mean, Baba never made any announcements of architecture, that one should actually do a sort of invisible architecture. It's not a tradition which demands attention. Okay? So, I'm showing you some of that. Next. So, here I'm getting, this is a building with a C. Uh, that is a street expansion line. So, here's a living dining and a bedroom looking at the C and there's another wall here. And that's a staff quarters because they are doctors. Right, next. So this is the drawing, next. Next, that's the reality. It's very much like the drawing. It's a single story building in the beginning. It's underplayed. I can show you it against the buildings next door. You hardly notice it, next. That is the entrance. The bedroom is here, the living dining is here, next. 
that's a kitchen at the end with a veranda dining. Next, uh, that's a garage screen and that's the entrance you come looking at from. Uh, all these are traditional details. Next. But that is your view. You know, why do you need architecture? The, the most important thing is the view, right? Which can be shut. It's a different way because they had to always shut because you get um, what you call drug addicts walking the beach. Next. So for me, this is architecture. Where it's an architecture almost is irrelevant to the main building. Okay. It is a respect of what you see and nature. Next. So that is the view again. That is a veranda. There's an upper veranda. Next. So that's the upper veranda. There's a planter. So that I do a double uh, colonnade so you can extend because there's a monsoon coming in. Next. And that is your view from the upstairs. I don't think it was important to do the building in gold. Next. So you're not going to believe that is my building. That is a school. And that's a church. You can't. It, it doesn't jump. Next. So this is another building on a T estate. You enter here. Uh, this is a service area with a generator. And you go up and you see the whole countryside. Next. Next. So this is a building. There's a veranda here. There's a living dining here. That's a pantry here. These are bedrooms. And that's a pavilion to show, create a foreground with this thing. And there's a car park there too. Next. So that's a peacock, which, I mean, this is a project, you know, this is in the south of Sri Lanka, which has the shrine of Kataragama, which is Skanda, or the second son of Shiva. And I have a soft spawn. I normally, if I try to say no, but if, if peacock intervenes, I generally say yes. Next. So that is going up with a copper handrail. Next. And that is your view. You know, so you, you don't emphasize on the building, you frame the view. Okay, next. So you can see these are other notions of a view. Next, right. I got a stone lion, which I also have, but it, from the entrance, you can see it. Next, that is me at a site visit. But, you know, I think that is what is important. You know, the landscape. Next, I'm not creating the landscape or the view, it's there. I'm just respecting it. So this is the courtyard. We have a copper urn to put flowers, next. Yeah, then I have a client uh, who, who is a member of parliament and suddenly, uh, because they won, uh, so from eight constituents a day, he suddenly has 200 constituents a day. So you need to provide toilets. So. I do a building where the men can go this way and the females can go that way. And that's the interior and they can also sit in a seat outside. Next. Uh, so, but what I have done is, uh, you can have a shower there. Uh, people can walk, but they're walking on a lower level. But from this area, you have views of a river and a landscape. So you can see here, you can go like this, right, to the toilet. There's a river, right? And is it completely open toilet? But that is your view from the toilet. You see, this notion that everything precious and all should be given to rich people is not important. I think that, I think everybody has a right. This double standards, you know, uh, rich people get one sort of architecture, poor people get another sort of architecture, is not necessary. So this is, if you shower, you have this stunning view of a river, private view of a river and a, that sort of landscape beyond. Next. Then I actually did his building, because again, a peacock sort of came into the way. And so you, it's at a lower level, but you go upstairs because that is where the garden is. Uh, and there's a sliver of a courtyard because you have to do inverted prisons, meaning you can't kill a person where the, everything outside is, uh, solid. Next. So this is a plan. You enter here. You can park things here. You go up and there's a courtyard with trees. There's a living dining. 
and there are only two bedrooms and he has an office and there's a kitchen and his security quarters are there. Next. So that's another, you can see there's a drawing of a peacock. That's a lower level. Next. So that is you going up. Next. So that is your entrance. The Buddhist shrine is twisted to the east. Next. So that's a Buddhist shrine. We bought an old painting, temple painting. So that is his shrine room facing east. Sorry, next. And you can see we have mixed concrete and old timber columns. That is the atmosphere. The veranda is granite. And we grew. It is only a slit to bring light and ventilation. Next. Uh, that is around the central courtyard. Next. Next, yeah, so that's another view. Next, uh, another view. Next, so that is his living dining. I mean, the party he belongs to has green as his motto, and we bought paintings together. Next, and what is amazing is the day it was open, you get different people. The family sits in the first veranda, the police sit in the last veranda. And people in between sit in the formal living room. Next. Uh, yeah, so this is the atmosphere. Next. Uh, yeah, that's a dining formal living room. Next. 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 That is his office room. Right. Next. That is his bedroom. But you must see that it's floating in the sky, so you borrow the landscape. Next. Uh, that's his toilet, view from his toilet, you know. You're actually, sh here you don't shower here, you're actually showering outside, looking at that view. And I think that is what life is all about. You know, a lot of people, I don't know what they are building for, but here we build, or at least I build, and at least I have learned that Jeffrey built for the enjoyment of life and the pleasure of life. Next. And that, that uh, the difference may be that my clients were, are poor. I mean, they are not rich, they are ordinary people. Uh, Jeffrey's clients were not. Uh, but so that is the view you get. So that I have to learn to borrow things so that it, it, the buildings itself are not very expensive. Next. So that's a guest room. That faces a veranda and that's a courtyard. Next. That's a guest room toilet. And they're completely open. Next. So that's a old piece in the veranda. Next. So this, uh, you know, my domestic had served me 30 years. So I decided that, I mean, I had extra money that I will buy some land next door and build him a house. Um, and it's a good thing. I mean, he married his cousin and he now has adopted two of his, her brother's children and her mother who's not very well and so on. So I thought, okay, damn it. You know, the problem is that again, you whenever I do things, one of the thing, lessons you learn from SOS, I can live in an SOS house. And I have, uh, you know, like I'm not doing charity. Now with Kuma, uh, he's more of a brother to me than most of my relations. Uh, and I give him exactly what I can have. Right, so this is his house. Next. So the, you enter here, you have a courtyard. Here, I gave him two flats because maybe one day when I'm gone, I'm 70 now, then he can rent one and get an income. So here's a, I gave him my old bajaj. So here's a living dining, kitchen, toilet, bedroom, looking into courtyards. Similar thing, you get, but you get above the garage an additional bedroom upstairs. There. So this is a very simple house, uh, but it costs same per square foot as mine. Next, and done by the same contractor. Next. So there's a courtyard in the middle. So that's your view. Next. Uh, so that is your entrance view. That's Kalu again. And the staircase goes there. Next. So that's Katragam Amiskanda. Next. So that's from the courtyard looking at the entrance. Next. So that's his living, dining, right? Pantry. Next. 
and he actually has genuine antique cupboards and all, you know, perhaps more expensive than the ones I have. I prefer simpler ones, uh, but he gets elaborate ones. Next, that is Kuma. And these are all our genuine paintings. It's not less costly. Next. So that's his toilet. You know, no different from mine. Next. Uh, that's from the garage. Next. So now we go upstairs. Next. That's his terrace. This is thing. Next. That is the view from his terrace. Next. That is the upper room, which I mean, I have now, I'm, I use it as a library. So this is our uh, dining room and the kitchen. The kitchen is not used. Next. Uh, that's a living room, upper living room. Next. So these are the sky. The, all this. You know, I mean, the odd thing is now uh, I decide to give the house to him. So, uh, I, I mean, the lawyer has to sign. So he comes sheepishly and says, sir, I mean, that's what they, how they talk. Uh, you have life interest. So I said, no, Kuma, I'm giving it to you. After you move in, you want to kick me out and not come and work for me. That's perfectly fine. But, you know, you have been with me for 30 years. You're like my brother. I don't think you'll do this. But if you do it, I don't mind. You know, I mean, that's... But these conditions, you know, the modern life is about conditions. You know, I have never signed a contract in my whole life. I've been working for 40 years. And that is another way of doing things, is that you begin to trust people. And those are those values which are important. You know, not contracts and... Because one of the great things about no contract is nobody can sue you because you have not signed anything. But anyway, you know, but it's a different approach to life. Okay. I mean, I think I know contract, but you can override it. You must know that now in my father's life, people did large contracts with a shake of a hand, not a document. I mean, their subordinates might have done documents later on, but they never did documents. Next. So that I, that's one of my f fascinating things. Next. So this, you're not going to believe, this sculpture cost um, 400,000 Indian rupees. But it, it is Kumar's. It's done by, I mean, he died, called Tesarana Singha. I, I took a year to pay for it. But these all, everything here belongs to Kumar. Okay. Now I'm not very sure how many people will do that. You know, there's this amazing thing called double standards. Next. Yeah, so this is one bedroom, the upper bedroom. Next. That is a toilet for that bedroom. Next. So that's a view. You can look at the courtyard from that bedroom. Next. This is the other bedroom. Again, that's with Skanda, which I took a long time to do. Next. That's in the garage, and that's a painting by Lucky Sennanayaka. Next. Yeah, next. So this is my, the last thing I'm going to show you. I think I'm well in time. Uh, I was asked a couple of 2018 whether I would do a cancer hospice uh, because that's the sort of thing I would like. Uh, of course, the lady is rather orthodox. So uh, I actually follow the profile. Of, it's a rural 100-bed cancer hospice. So you'll find that there are wards, but they're open wards. There are no private rooms and all. It's a government hospital. So here, but the odd thing is that there's about 16 types of toilets. You know, I mean, they haven't got over it. In Singapore, one toilet is used by everybody. You know, cleaners, everybody. But here, they still have a hierarchy. So what I do is I do a double screen. You know, double screen here, which gives more shade, in which I can put the air conditioners and an additional toilet if necessary, right? So there's a peri it, the building follows the periphery of the site. There's a courtyard to give cross ventilation. We have a grill on the outside so that even if the windows are open, nobody can come in through the outside. It's lockable. There are three access. There's a soil treatment plant, and this is the ancillary building. It's going to be inaugurated on the 8th. Otherwise, I would have stayed longer in India. Next. So 
that's upper flow. It's very similar. I mean, you can see it's a little clearer the forac. Next, and that is the section. Next, that's the entrance. It, it, they, these are photographs taken about a month or two ago. We can possibly see, you can see you can see a courtyard. That's a train going, and this is a double screen into which I put air conditioners or whatever occasional toilet storeroom and so on. Next. So you can see that this is a soil treatment plant. I'm doing a security hut there. Next. Uh, that's a courtyard. Okay, that's the entrance. Next. So now people can't. The thing is, I think that if, uh, like I use color SOS, I mean, uh, we don't have things like radiotherapy. We only have chemotherapy. Uh, and these are rural folks who show cancer when it's too late. Okay? So the only thing you can do is not give them a peaceful, to give them a happy environment in which to spend the last days of their life, you know? And that is what I try to do, you know? So it's a little funny. I can tell you another story when we go a little further next. So this is the colors which I did, this shades. Then in a public building, you have to worry whether, you know, if you do one sort of color with the opposite political party object. So then you put both colors, then they can't object to anything. Next. So yes, now these light fittings are designed by me. Next. That is the courtyard. I mean, no, very little maintenance. And I did enamel roofs. Next. So that is my contract and me with this courtyard. Next. And then I actually decide to have a mural at the far wall. So now this is now this lady, poor lady, orthodox Tamil lady, and I have now bowled over with color, and she's not very sure whether I know what I'm doing. But luckily, uh, Dr. Siyambala Pitya, who's the oncologist in charge of this hospital, he said, no, madam, I have painted my house using his book. So that's fine. So at that point, everybody sort of keeps a little quiet. So I said, I want a colorful mural. So then I said, no, don't worry about it. I'll pay for it. Because I, I think that's one of the easy ways out. If you say you will pay for it, I was hoping she will say this. Is. Then I get a message to say, you know, this is a donation done in her name and her husband's name. Uh, she would like to go to heaven alone with her husband. So meaning she doesn't want anyone else to partake of the merit by paying for something of the building. Then I think it took her about six months to think about it. And then she came and said, no, you have been, you know, I'm very happy with what has happened. You have permission to pay for the artist. And you can also come with us to heaven. So that's fine. Next. <laughs> So, I'm okay, next. So, this is an artist called Chamika, who also I helped when he was in a bad way because he had a heart attack and he had stents put in. He lost his job, but I've given him work for the last three, four years. He has a little baby, but I think an incredible artist. Next. So, he, yeah, he manages, and this is almost complete, uh, and I've been allowed to pay for it, but I'm now dying to get three more murals done. So I don't negotiate. Next. No, don't worry. Next. This is for Tipu Sultan's Palace in Bangalore. Next. This is one of my favorite buildings. Next. Okay. So I would like to end this very quickly. What is my attitude towards, I wouldn't say architecture, life, but because my life is an integral part of architecture, my favorite quotation, I'm just taking extracts uh, from a poem by Jacques Brel, He's French from 1968. I wish you endless dreams and the furious desire to make some of them come true. I wish you passions. I wish you silences. I wish you to be yourself, proud of it and happy because happiness is our destiny. Thank you very much. Um,
can Professor Katie Ravindran also come on stage? Would like to give you some mementos before you close this. Can I also request uh, Mr. Niyotia to please come to the stage so he can hand over the mementos to them. Just step. Vijay, if you could come and take the stage and vote of thanks. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Anjalindran. Thank you, Mr. Ravindran. Thanks to Mr. Nyotia. And thank you everybody here who's been uh, very, who have been very patient and uh, I think we had an excellent uh, evening with some wonderful uh, insight into architecture. Thanks so much for coming and being with us in this occasion and wish you all a very good night. Thank you. <laughs>